Right, well, hello and welcome to this UCL Lunch Hour Lecture on Community Archaeology and the Discovery of an Ancient Roman Palace. Now, my name is Andrew Reynolds and I'm a Professor of Medieval Archaeology here at UCL's Institute of Archaeology and I'll be chairing today's lecture. Now, it's my great honour and um, a privilege to introduce today's speaker, uh, Dr Chris Locke here. Now, Chris is a senior lecturer here at the Institute of Archaeology. He joined the local archaeology, archaeological society as a schoolboy before going on to study archaeology at university and work as a professional field technician. Chris joined uh, the staff of the Institute in 1996 as a postdoctoral research fellow and went then on uh, to become a, a lecturer here. Now, Chris has always remained involved in community archaeology, becoming director of the Wellin Archaeological Society in 2009. Chris has, um, over the course of his career, developed an increasing interest and expertise in geophysical surveying techniques. Um, he began uh, his interest in this field by undertaking um, earth resistant surveys uh, for his uh, dissertation uh, as an undergraduate student. Now, geophysical survey is now one of Chris's main research interests. And um, working with the community archaeology uh, geophysics group has allowed him to pursue his passion for community archaeology, geophysics, and the archaeology of, of, of Hertfordshire. Now, before we, um, before we begin, I wanted to let you know that we'll have uh, a bit of time at the end of the lecture to take questions, and these can be submitted at any point during Chris's talk by going to Slido, which you should enter into your internet browser, entering the event code, hashtag palace. Now, I'll now hand over to Chris uh, for his talk. Um, so over to you, Chris, and we'll see everybody again towards the uh, at the end of the lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming. I'll just share my screen. So the um, topic I want to talk to you about today is to introduce the Community Archaeology Geophysics Group uh, and the surveys we've been doing, and particularly the work we've been doing at the Roman city of Verulamium. Now, the group started about 10 years ago when the Arts and Humanities Research Council, or the main funding body um, for Arts and Humanities uh, at the universities, uh, announced a uh, grant scheme for what they called a jointly authored research project. And the idea was to have a research project that was jointly run between uh, local societies, local groups uh, and the university. Now, as I was both a senior lecturer here and director of the Wellington Archaeological Society, this is something that appealed to me. So I contacted a number of other local groups and we talked about what we'd like to do. And all of them were very keen on the idea of setting up a geophysics group that was like an umbrella organisation over their societies. Because in each society, there were one or two members who were interested in geophysics, um, but they didn't have either the skill or the equipment to do the surveys. And also there's an argument that for every society to have the equipment means that it will spend a lot of time not doing very much. So sharing, pooling equipment expertise is what we did. Uh, and you can see the list of groups which were involved in that um, application and we were successful uh, and funded. Uh, sadly, some of those um, are um, no longer in existence. Um, originally, the project was to do surveys within Hertfordshire. Um, and on Roman and Iron Age sites. And you can see in this map the outline of the county of Hertfordshire. You can also see that over the 10 years, we slightly expanded um, from Hertfordshire. But also this was originally a one-year funded project, and we are now into year 10. So I think we're doing quite well um, for, the, for the money that we got. Now, originally, the grant paid for us to buy the magnetometer that you can see up uh, in the top left-hand corner, made by a company called Forster. And that's the machine we used for the first uh, nine years until we wore it out. Um, and we had um, access to a total station for laying out grids. Just as we've expanded from doing just magnetometry, we have also now expanded uh, into ground penetrating radar, um, earth resistance survey, Magnetic Susceptibility Survey, as well as our new magnetometer that you can see up in the top left-hand corner. Um, and we are now able to um, locate our surveys using a high-accuracy uh, differential GPS. Um, so a differential GPS is just like the one on your phone, um, only it's accurate to about eight or nine millimetres instead of about eight or nine metres. Um, so 
when we're doing surveys, it gives us a very close uh, control over our data. Now, obviously, in a short talk like this, I can't go into the um, theory of geophysical surveys in any great detail, but I just want to quickly go through the three main techniques that we use um, and um, show you some results um, so you can read the rest of the images in this talk uh, with a certain amount of um, great understanding. Um, so well, our main technique is magnetometry. And the reason that we're interested in magnetism is not the ferrous things, because they tend to be the things we aren't interested in. So horseshoes, barbed wire fences, old rusty water pipes. Um, but what we are interested in are things that are burnt, which are often things like pits, um, and kilns and halves. And it happens that soil formation processes mean that organic soil is slightly more magnetic than subsoil. So where you've got a ditch or pit or something like that that's full of um, nice topsoil, um, like your um, um, compost heap, um, that will also be uh, a little bit more magnetic and we can detect that. So this is our new cart. It has five sensors um, in a row, which means that as we push it along, it's collecting five lines of data, which makes life very quick for collecting data. It has this high accuracy um, GPS on the top, so we don't have to um, survey in grids and so on. It works out where it is as we're going along. Um, and each of the sensors actually has two sensors in it, which enable us to um, subtract out variations in the Earth's magnetic field so that the um, readings we're getting are local magnetism and hopefully largely archaeology, but occasionally, obviously, um, things which are around and about. So this steel cable you can see in the background here, unfortunately, would show uh, in our data. The second tech we ne technique we use is earth resistance survey. And in earth resistance survey, we pass an electric current through the soil uh, to create a circuit. And then we have a second circuit which measures the um, difference in the voltage from which we can calculate the resistance. In order to pass electric current through the soil, you need water and you need salt. Now, the salt distribution isn't usually very interesting, but water is. If we have something solid like a wall or a road, we'll get a high resistance reading. If we have something uh, that pools water, like a ditch or a pit, we'll get a low resistance reading. And so by plotting out those readings, hopefully we'll get an image of what's below the surface. Now, you'll notice that I've actually got three lines at the bottom here, and that's simply because this technique is quite slow. So in the box, there is a switching mechanism, the multiplexer, which enables us to take two readings side by side each time we move the machine and speeds up how quickly we can um, do the survey and therefore how many readings we can take uh, in each square metre. The last technique um, we're going to use, and one we'll see quite a lot of in this talk, is ground penetrating radar. Now, this um, is just like radar um, that's used to detect aircraft, uh, but instead of pointing up into the sky, we point it down into the ground. And as the radar wave goes through the ground, every time there's a change in material, it will change the speed that that radar wave is moving, and some of it will bounce back and be recorded at the antenna, the grey box in the bottom of this little cart. So the funny looking diagram on the right hand side of the screen is what's known as a radar gram. It's a vertical slice through the ground and the bright black and white bits like this bit here is something at the top here is reflecting a signal. And these are essentially the sort of echoes of it beneath it. Um, now, we don't really want to look at these vertical uh, images too much because they're quite difficult to read, although it is very important to look at those images when we're trying to interpret the data. But ideally what we want to do um, is to take all these vertical images, stack them side by side uh, in the software. In this image, I'm only showing one, but there were 61 of these slices um, in this data set, and then cut it in the other direction. So we've got vertical slices are our um, raw data that we've collected with this machine. We want to get the software to cut it in the other direction to give us a horizontal map view. 
Um, now, this is a survey we did uh, last Saturday, and we can see this strong black line running across the plot. It's not very exciting. It's a pipe, but it illustrates the, the principle very well. And this image is rather oddly looking from underneath the slice. And you can see these strong echoes in the radargram and this black slice coming across, which is that pipeline. Um, so ideally, what we end up with with ground penetrating radar is a series of images um, near the surface, this one. And we can see the plow scars still surviving underneath the grass in this image, then slightly deeper. And in this case, I've just flipped the panic because it was slightly um, clearer to see the walls. But you can see this nice building starting to show. This is actually a Roman building next to the temple at um, Verlanian. And then we get a little bit deeper. We can see a little bit more of this building and a little bit deeper and a little bit deeper and a little bit deeper. And then once we get down to the bottom image here, you can see that this building has completely disappeared. So this building has much shallower foundations than this building. So it's the only technique of the three we're going to be looking at today that in its ordinary native form gives you a 3D model of what's under the ground, gives you some sort of sense of changes with depth. And then this image just takes one little bit of the survey from um, Verulanium. And this is uh, A is the Earth Resistance Survey. We've got a road running here. And then we've got another road running at right angles, which is Watling Street. Now, you may have picked up, as I said, well, roads are going to be high resistance, which are the darker readings. So why is this road light? Well, that road is light because it was robbed for building material to build St. Albans Abbey. Um, so this is actually a hole where there should be a road which has been robbed away. And then you can see this rather nice Roman building with a corridor on one side of the courtyard and a series of rooms around it. Very similar plot, though a little bit more detail by the ground penetrating radar. Um, much clearer view of this building, including a, a, an extra little um, corridor down one side that doesn't show in the Earth resistance. But notice the way that this road doesn't show quite so clearly in the GPR um, data. And then we've got the magnetometry data. And here we can start picking up pits and ditches as well as the road. Now, unusually, this building shows very well uh, on this plot. Often, buildings do not show very clearly in magnetometry data um, because the stuff they're built on is not very magnetic. So you'll notice that, that these buildings up here really don't show at all, but the pits and things around them do show very well. Um, and um, occasionally, I wonder why I bother, because if you just look on Google Earth, you can actually see that building very nicely as a parch mark uh, in the grass. But mostly, mostly we don't get um, results quite that clearly from Google Earth. So at Verulanium, um, the way the Community Archaeology Geophysics Group usually works is that we do surveys with other groups. So the idea is that we don't turn up and do a survey for you, we do a survey with you. And we've done lots of surveys like that for different groups, 57, 58 of them now. Um, but the survey at Verulanium is very much our project. It's our survey. It's the one that we are particularly keen on and working on. Um, for ourselves. And at um, Verulanium, we've now completed over um, a square kilometer of magnetometry data. Most of that up until um, 2022 was with the old machine, and then little bits of it are with the um, new machine. And then on the Gorenbury side of the town, the northwestern side of the town, is where we started doing the GPR survey in 2015. Um, and that's slowly built up over the years. A little bit erratic to start with because we weren't certain we'd have access to the machine for all that long. But once we realised it, it, we could borrow the machine for a while, it was a little bit more consistent. Nothing happened in 2020. Um, and then we filled in this last bit um, in 2021 and 2022. So we've done 35 hectares of ground penetrating radar um, on the Gormby side of the Alignment. And that's about 700 kilometers of radar grounds. So people have pushed that funny little cart for 700 kilometers. And then the Earth Resistance Survey 
because we were reliant on water, and we usually work in the summer, there have been a couple of summers where we haven't been able to survey because the weather has just simply been too dry uh, and we couldn't get nice, reliable results. Um, and um, in 2022, we couldn't even get the probes in the ground. But hopefully you can see very nicely the, the Roman road network showing um, on this and some of the buildings and so on um, very clearly. So where is Verulanium? Well, Verulanium is about 25 miles north of London, where this big arrow is pointing. Um, it's the, uh, after London and Sirencester, it's the third biggest Roman town in Roman Britain. Um, it was also important because of the big public towns, five of them don't have a modern town built on top of them. Uh, Roxeter up in Shropshire was the first one which had a, uh, a pretty comprehensive geophysical survey undertaken on it at the end of the 90s. Kerwent has had about three quarters of it done. Silchester was done by Reading University. Keister by Norwich uh, has been done. But of those five towns, Verulanium was is the biggest of the towns and it didn't have a comprehensive survey when we started in 2013. Uh, it now has a comprehensive mag survey and we're getting there with the other methods. So here's an aerial photograph of Verulanium. You can see mostly it's um, parkland. So Verulanium Park is a public park bought by the, the city in the early 1930s. Gornbury is part of the um, Gornbury estate owned by Lord Verulam. Um, there were some fairly major excavations here in the 1930s, as we'll see in a moment. Um, and you can visit a Roman mosaic in a building here. The museum is here, and the Forum Basilica complex uh, is under the church, the museum, car park, and the museum in this area of the town. The theatre on the other side of the blue line, which is a road, was excavated by then Kathleen Kenyon in 1933. Um, the lake was also built in the 1930s, and that has an a impact on um, the archaeology as we'll see uh, towards the end of this talk. So the two major excavation campaigns, and there have been a lot of excavations at Berlanium over the years, starting with a chap called Richard Grove Lowe in the 1840s. But the two major excavations, the first major excavation campaign was by Sir Mortimer Wheeler, the founder of the Institute of Archaeology, where I now work. Uh, and his wife, um, Tessa Wheeler. Uh, and they dug a large area in the park um, and a, quite a few smaller trenches across features around the town. And then um, almost 30 years later, Shepard Frere, who was at the time still working at the Institute of Archaeology as well, he's the, the, the chap I got my pointer on here, um, did another series of excavations. Here he is in his shorts. Um, along the line of where they were going to build or extend um, a new road uh, between St Albans and Hemel Hempstead, known as Blue House Hill. Um, when I first went to Verulanium as a school child, uh, this giant model was in the middle of the museum. And we could see that even though the town wall, um, the route of the town wall was very well known and enclosed a really rather large area, about 81 hectares, most of the town we didn't know very much about, apart from the um, roads um, and a few buildings which have been um, excavated. If we look at the map published by Rosalind Niblett, um, this is the area which Mortimer Wheeler excavated. This is the area that Shepherd Fair excavated. The purple line is something called the 1955 ditch. Now, it wasn't built in 1955. It was first sectioned by Shepard Frere in 1955. And that purple line is the first century boundary of the town, built in about um, AD 80, um, to about 20 years after Boudicca um, burnt the town down. Um, the green line is the town wall which survives quite well in parts and is completely missing in other parts. This section here, for example, has been completely robbed. This section survives quite well in the woodland. Um, and uh, the date of the town wall is probably in the second half of the third century um, AD. 
This strip of buildings along here were the ones that Shepherd Frere excavated when they were um, both building and extending the road up to um, up to Hemel Hempstead. And we can see that the theatre, the final phase of the excavation of the theatre by Dan Kathleen Kenyon, originally it was excavated by Richard Grove Lowe in the 1840s, um, and the temple excavated by A.J. Lowther also in 1933. Uh, and a few other bits and pieces. Keep in mind for a moment this line, the 1955 ditch. So we aren't the first people to do geophysics um, at Bear Lane, and there have been various smaller scale surveys over the years. And one of the first surveys was done by a chap called Martin Aiken in 1959 and 1960. And in the mid 50s, a German scholar had proposed that magnetometry, measuring magnetism, might be able to detect um, kilns and burnt features. And so Martin Aitken built a magnetometer, uh, tested it out at a site called Dura Brevi um, up near Peterborough. Uh, it worked very well. He found some kilns. He also found some pits um, and an old mattress. Um, we always pick up the occasional modern thing we're not interested in. And so Shepard Frere asked him, having sectioned the 1955 ditch and realised there's a feature there but didn't know exactly where it went, he asked Martin Aitken whether he might be able to trace the line of the 1955 ditch using this uh, magnetometer, uh, which he did. So the, the line you saw on the previous um, plan is Martin Aitken's um, uh, map of the uh, site. Um, this is a comparison between Aitken's plan of the northwest corner of the 1955 ditch so the black dots are strong magnetism, the open dots are strongish magnetism, and the gaps are where um, he took readings, but the magnetic readings were quite low. And if we compare that to my survey, our survey, I should say, um, of the same corner, you can see strong magnetism, strong magnetism, strong magnetism, strong magnetism. But there's a very good correlation between um, uh, our survey and uh, Aiken's survey. The difference being is that Martin Aiken was taking one reading about every three feet. We were taking one reading every 10 centimetres. Uh, he took two seasons to take three and a half thousand readings and thought the technique was brilliant because it was so quick. Uh, we were taking um, 3,000 readings about every eight or nine minutes or thereabouts. Um, and we get obviously get a lot more detail than he did. But I think it's a huge tribute to, to Aitken's um, early surveys uh, that the results were quite so successful uh, and marry up so nicely uh, with the more modern surveys that we're doing. So here's um, a slightly zoomed in plan of the town. Um, you can see the 1955 ditch. So there it is. Take it away again. You can see the 1955 ditch very nicely running uh, around the town like this. Your eye might be drawn to this very strong, bright white and black line that actually goes up under the road and then along the edge of the river. Um, that's what happens when somebody puts uh, an 18 inch cast iron gas main through the middle of your Roman town. And we do pick up lots of modern features. So you can see much smaller, um, but still present a whole series of these thinner um, pipelines, which are all modern utilities. And when we're interpreting these surveys, we do have to um, subtract out of them the things that we know are modern. Luckily, on the Gormley side of town, we don't have too many modern features. There's the odd one here or there. But on the park side of the town, unsurprisingly, we've got cricket practice pitches, we've got water pipes, we've got football goal mouths, we've got the gas main, um, the footpaths and so on. But despite that, we can still see here's Watling Street, the main Roman road from London up to the northwest, running through the town, um, and a whole series of buildings. There's some quite nice large townhouses down here and so on. So we're still getting a reasonable amount of detail within um, town. So obviously, in a short talk like this, I can't um, go through every single thing we found, um, and we want me to, uh, because there are 
quite a lot of things that have come up. So I've just picked out a few of the sort of highlights, if you like, of things that we found. Um, and in the southern side of the town, so here's the 1955 ditch again. We're right down in the southern part of the town. Here's Watling Street running through here. This triangle here, for those of you who know the site, this triangle is the site of the Triangular Temple, which was excavated by Mortimer Wheeler. And he completely excavated it and then backfilled it. So the building doesn't show because all the, the strata and layers are just um, jumbled up uh, in his excavation trench. But what I wanted to show in this slide are these things that there's a um, pair that looks like Mickey Mouse's ears there. Um, there's another pair of Mickey Mouse's ears here. Um, there's a single one down here. Um, and we know what these are. These are very distinctive um, magnetic features. This is a magnetometry plot, very strongly magnetic. So remember that magnetism has a, um, a negative and a positive, um, or north and south pole, if you like. And the, the negative is shown in white and the positive is shown in black. Sort of mid gray is zero, not very interesting. And we know what these are because we've dug quite a few of them over the years. Um, these are Roman pottery kilns. So you can see there's a firing chamber with a flue and a stoke hole. And if we look at this one over here, we can see the bigger firing chamber, a short flue uh, and a stoke hole. This is one that's been excavated from Verulamium outside the town. Um, and this one is probably um, one kiln that's been replaced. So um, this is probably the earlier kiln that once the firing chamber became a bit damaged, uh, they just turned it around 90 degrees and built a new firing chamber and, and gave up on that one. And the pottery industry at Verulamium is quite well known. Um, and this is a, a, one of the um, vessels that was made um, uh, as part of the Verulanium ware. Verulanium ware is a slight misnomer because the kilns actually stretch along Watton Street down into the suburbs of London. They, they were made over quite a, a distance, um, but it's known as Verulanium ware, and we have got um, a good half dozen kilns. There was one kiln that I wasn't certain about, this one here, because it wasn't quite such a nice clear shape, but it was slightly uphill and in an area where there's surviving medieval plowing. Um, but when I went back to the old excavation reports, this building, which is this building, it's sort of five building three, excavated by Montemar Wheeler in the 1930s, the early 1930s, actually almost certainly excavated by Tessa Wheeler. Um, the back of that building was a pit, pit six, and in pit six was kiln furniture and pottery wasters. Now you don't tend to take the wasters and the, and the kiln furniture very far when you throw them away. So it seems very likely that this is a pottery kiln and this is where the rubbish from that kiln um, was thrown away. So that was quite a nice confirmation that these features are actually pottery kilns. So what else do we have? Well, on the northern side of the town, we spotted this long, weird, linear feature. Now, this sort of dark, so strong magnetism with a slightly um, weaker uh, negative magnetism, so a darker black and the, and the little white halo, if you like, that is um, the um, typical um, signature for a ditch, just like the 1955 ditch here. We can see it's got a strong black um, that positive and a slightly weaker halo of, of negative magnetism. Here we've got a ditch. But it was a little bit puzzling to start with because it's not on the street grid. Here's the street grid. It doesn't seem to be related to the 1955 ditch. It just wiggles its way uh, across the town. So we were initially slightly puzzled as to what this feature was. Until one day I was looking at the old um, 19th century ordnance survey mapping of um, Verlanium, um, which very helpfully plotted the 300 foot contour. There we go. And you'll see that the 300 foot contour very closely matches the line of this ditch feature that we had detected in our magnetometry survey. Um, the only reason I can think for digging a ditch that closely follows the contour uh, is as an aqueduct. Now, 
those of you who've been on a holiday to Spain or the, the south of France will have the Pont du Gard or something like that in mind. Unfortunately, in Rome, Britain, aqueducts are essentially a glorified muddy ditch. Um, and that's what we have here. And up the valley somewhere, they've taken water out of the River Burr. Here's the Burr. Directed it down the aqueduct ditch, which is at a slightly less steep gradient than the river. So by the time you get to Berlanium here, there's a 16 foot drop between where the aqueduct is and um, the road. So between here and the road, which is the bit we haven't surveyed along here, which gives you water pressure. Um, now, we knew there was an aqueduct of Berlanium because on Google Earth, you can see it as a slightly darker line. If you look in the aerial um, satellite images and aerial photographs, and this is an earlier photograph in black and white, and you can see the aqueduct wiggling across the field here. What we didn't know is how it got into Berlanium and where it went um, when it got there. And we've now managed to identify that through my site. Okay. Um, the other thing about the town, about the, the aqueduct, sorry, here's the aqueduct uh, faded out in the background. And down slope from the aqueduct is a very large building just here. So here's um, a road. And we can see in this case, so the background is the magnetometry, the image in the foreground is ground penetrating radar. And in this case, we've got some buildings that show very well as dark lines. So nice surviving walls. But here we've got walls that are shown as white lines. And what's happened here is that those walls have been robbed out for building material. So we've got quite a big building where it's been worth robbing the building material, particularly the big tiles that you get in Roman buildings that the Tower of St. Albans Abbey um, is built from. Now, because this is ground penetrating radar, we can look a little bit deeper. And if we go a bit deeper, we can see this building a little bit more clearly, and we start seeing more surviving floors uh, and more details of the walls of this building. And then when we go a little bit deeper again, this building has got shallower foundations, so it's disappeared. But this building has very deep foundations, and we've even got a nice little apsidal um, uh, feature um, just here. And obviously the robbing of this building didn't get right down to the very bottom of the walls and they're showing quite well in this low um, slice. I speculate, and it is purely speculation, that this might be the town aqueduct. So we've got water coming along here, which gives you water pressure downwards. Um, this might be the town baths. And then next to the town baths, are the theatre and the temple and various uh, other public buildings. So this possibly, this complex might be um, the uh, baths for the Roman town. Just a quick look at some of the buildings that are in the middle of the town. Um, and you can see it's a slightly messy image because this has been processed using different bits of software. And I'm uh, in the middle of trying to stitch all these things together and make a, a nicer image. But we can see lots and lots of domestic buildings. Now, if we just add the streets in, um, these are numbered by um, two scholars, uh, Rosalind Niblett and Isabel Thompson. Um, and then just look at this one insula, so this one town block. If we look at what was known before the geophysics, and here's that block, there's a little bit of one building, a little bit of another building, and then some long, thin feature which curiously doesn't show in any of our geophysics. Um, I'm not so certain about that one. Um, so we have uncovered enormous uh, addition to the number of buildings that we know about within the town. Uh, and if we go back to the, the ground penetrating radar, we also have quite a mixture of private buildings. So we've got a couple of very big townhouses with corridors and rooms of a style that's quite well known from Rome and Britain. These are quite big, luxurious houses. And then we've got a series of much smaller buildings with um, alleyways into the back, more uh, ephemeral buildings at the back. And these are probably um, a mixture of dwellings and workshops and shops. Um, and they face onto, unsurprisingly, face onto the road. Um, and then we have one structure that I'm unsure about. She looks a little bit like a stone granary. 
Um, the odd thing is, is we don't really get stone granaries like this in the south of England. Um, and if that turns out to actually be a, what I think it looks like to be a stone granary, it would be um, an unusual find. So here's Watton Street that we saw before. Here's the bit that's been robbed. Here's this nice big building that we saw when I was comparing the magnetometry um, and the um, earth resistance and the ground penetrating radar surveys. This is the ground penetrating radar survey of this area. And as we go from the 1955 ditch, so the original boundary of the town, along Watton Street to the later boundary of the town, and there's a gate that Wheeler excavated um, in the woodland here, we can see a variety of buildings, um, some quite small facing onto the street, some a bit grander. But these are all the sorts of buildings we would expect um, to find uh, uh, in the town. Once we cross this red line, which is the line of the 1955 ditch, we meet a monumental archway. Um, and this was the marker of the northwestern edge of the town when the 1955 ditch was the town's official um, boundary. And that was excavated in 1961 by Shepherd Fred. Once we get beyond that, into further into the town, this is where I think that bathhouse might be. Here's the theatre, which you can go and visit. We get a series of buildings which cease to look like ordinary small domestic buildings and start looking at much larger, much grander complexes of buildings. Now, because I've got a relatively short amount of time, um, I'm not going to go into the whole sequence of buildings. I just want to look at this one building uh, in here. Um, so what we've got is a large building with a central range of rooms, some of which have surviving floors. And then on the northeastern side, there is a colonnade. And that colonnade, so that's here, is looking out across the River Burn. At the back of it, there's another corridor. Then there's an open courtyard with a very strange looking building, which is a long, thin building without any, hardly any interior rooms at all. Um, another courtyard, and then what I think is the entrance to this whole um, complex here, and then this is Watton Street. And this is the building I'm calling a palace. And the reason I think it's a palace is if it was a public building, this building would face onto the main road through the middle of the town. And it hasn't. It's turned its back on the town. It's looking out of the town across um, the river. Now, this is the same image, just turned round slightly so I can fit two images side by side. And to give you some sense of scale, um, this is the nave of St Albans Abbey. Um, and this is the largest abbey nave uh, in Britain. Uh, and it's about the same size as the building that we have discovered uh, in the Jeffers Conserva. Um, so this is an enormous building. It's 80 metres long um, and about 20 metres uh, wide. Really quite, and that's just this wing of this um, building. Now there are some parallels to that building. So here's a villa at Eccles in Kent. Um, that's actually a little bit bigger. It's over 100 metres long. But all the parallels I've been able to find so far, I have to say I won't find one slightly later on, but all the ones I've been able to find so far um, actually are in the countryside. They aren't in towns. And what makes this particular building so unusual is that it's a building inside the Roman town at Berlin. If we look at buildings um, uh, around the northwestern provinces that are of this sort of giant palatial scale, a lot of them have water features in front of them. Uh, and I wonder, Verulanium, whether the water feature is the river, that rather than building an artificial uh, water feature in front of their palace, they've built the palace so it overlooks the river and um, uh, has a view uh, into the fields and the countryside uh, beyond. Notice that here, which is the magnetometry survey, the palace does not show at all. There's clearly something going on. There's faint hints of things magnetic, but really you'd have no idea that the, the, that main wing of that giant building existed. 
Interesting, this back wing shows quite well, but this wing really doesn't show at all. And that's why we are not just doing magnetometry server, but we're doing mag and res and GPR. Each of the techniques gives us a slightly different piece of information about what's happening uh, within the city. Here, we've got the road that leads out from the theatre. There's a little bend in it, and then it crosses the town wall. And we think there may have been some sort of gate here. And then there's a causeway leading down to the river. And the Magnetontry survey seems to show that there was some sort of box work, probably timber box work, reinforcing this causeway as it comes down to the um, river. You'll notice also that there's two sort of lines either side. And if you look at the LIDAR data, here's that causeway. And you can see the way that this meander in the river has been reinforced. And I think this meander has been deliberately strengthened and reinforced in order to stop the causeway and the bridge across the road, across the river, sorry, into the field opposite from eroding away as the river flows down um, in this direction. What's on the other side? Well, we haven't surveyed the other side yet, but there's lots of things showing in Google Earth which tempt us to try to survey over there. There are these little blobs. Um, which might be burials. They're not going to be individual burials. They're too big, but they might be um, uh, large pits or mausolea, this sort of thing. And there are faint hints of other buildings and roads and ditches and so on. So this is a site, a field that we'd quite like to survey at some point um, and get a feel for what was happening just outside the town on the other side of that bridge and that causeway. So just... What do we found out about the town as a whole? Well, what's it, one of the things I find quite interesting, here's the stone wall, is there's large areas of the town enclosed by the stone wall that have virtually nothing built in it. So the town wall was built much, much larger than it needed to be, and almost certainly was um, as much a vanity project as something that actually had useful um, functions. Within the town, We've got a very busy uh, industrial area on the southern side. We've got a series of major public buildings, the palace, various other buildings, the, the bathhouse, if that is the bathhouse, the temple, the theatre, the forum, basilica complex and so on in the centre of the town. And then a large area where we have a mixture of both small, more modest dwellings and really much larger, grander dwellings. There's a couple of bits we haven't been able to access. So this field here, we haven't got permission to survey in yet, hoping to do. Um, and this area, unfortunately, is covered by upcast from when they dug the lake. Uh, and everything is just a little bit too deep for us to see what's going on uh, in that area. I just want to thank um, UCL, who um, provide all the equipment that we use, uh, and CIHA, um, who lent us the GPR for five years until we managed to get grants by our own and the original grant from the Arts and Humanities Research Council. But I particularly want to thank all those volunteers who form part of the group. I'm the person who gets to stand here, or sit here in this case, um, and tell everybody about what we've been doing and what we've been finding. But this group of people, and this is only a small subset of them, are the people who've done all the hard work pushing this machine 700 kilometres um, and collected all the data that you've seen the um, very quick, brief results from uh, from our server. Um, and with that, uh, thank you very much. And that's the end of my um, talk. Uh, very many thanks, Chris. That was uh, that, that's amazing. I mean, it shows uh, just what you can do with uh, engagements between uh, academic uh, institutions uh, and, and members of the public. Um, and you know, the scale of the work that you've undertaken there is um, really, really quite, quite something and, and widely appreciated as, as such. Well, we have time for a few, uh, for a few quick questions. Um, uh, one, uh, so we, we've had a few questions in from, from our audience. Uh, one of these is, uh, what dates do you think the palace is a, on the basis, for example, of architectural uh, and excavated uh, parallels? Well, at Verulanium, there was a major fire uh, in the Antonine period, around about AD 155. Um, and either side of that fire, the architecture changes a bit. 
Um, and the buildings built after the fire tend to have more substantial stone foundations uh, and be a slightly larger, grander scale. And I can't see on the palace site any sign of it having burnt down. Yeah. Um, so I think it probably postdates AD 155. Um, and we think that the town wall was built around about AD 270. Um, Shepherd Fair and Sir Mortimer Wheeler disagreed as to the date by about a century, so there's a little bit of uncertainty there. But it strikes me as unlikely that you would build uh, a, a long portico like that where you, you can imagine sitting out drinking whatever you drank and looking out across the view uh, if your view was the back of the clay rampart and the inside of the town wall. So yeah. I think it fits into that gap between the Antonine fire uh, and the building of the town wall. So from, say, 150 or so to 250. One of the big weaknesses of geophysical survey is it doesn't give you dates. So you're always based on looking for parallels or other sorts of evidence and so on. Um, it just, just gives you a plan um, that you have to, have to work from. Now, well, that kind of sequence makes perfect sense, Chris. Um, and we've sort of got a, a, a related question, which is, um, about again about um, you know the interpretation of this um, of structure as as part of a palace. I mean you you've shown some very clear parallels for that. Um, but I wondered if you might sort of expand a little on uh, what kind of people occupied palaces in the Roman period. Well, yeah. um, I must admit, using using the word palace is is a little bit of a um, PR <laughs> gambit, really, because it, it attracts attention. And the only reason I really use the word palace rather than villa is usually we think of villas as being something in the countryside rather than something in a town. And in this case, um, because it's in the town. Um, now, there are the only other palace that I know of in Roman Britain is a building that's been claimed to be the governor's palace. So the, 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 the main administrator of the Roman province, um, based in London. Um, who was there? We just don't know. Um, one person did wonder whether one of the few emperors that visited Britain may have wanted somewhere to stay. It strikes me that that's a very big building to build very quickly and um, yeah. <laughs> for somebody to stay in for a couple of weeks. I wonder whether that Verulanium, as the third biggest town in Roman Britain, clearly there were people who thought themselves quite important by the size of the town wall they built, which they didn't need, various other things. So I suspect it's probably um, uh, a, a very um, uh, powerful local dignitary um, who had a slight um, <laughs> ego trip when he built himself quite such a big um, townhouse um, but it is a it is a difficult question as to why that building is there and we don't know why that building's there at the moment um, we didn't even know that building existed 18 months ago so uh, um, thinking is is still um, we're still thinking through the implications of it and I think that you know the, the sighting of the structure along with the river frontage is really quite something isn't it and um, it um, I, I wonder whether you sort of think that there might be sort of or there may have been sort of terracing and gardens and so on down to the water's edge and related to that um you know was the to what degree was the river navigable i don't yeah. think the river was ever particularly navigable right um there's quite a wide floodplain um and um i think it was always fairly braided it was the sort of thing you could drag a um a barge up or punt up but I don't, don't, because all along that side of the town, the wall is missing. Um, and I think what happened in the medieval period is the easiest way to rob the town wall was to knock it over into the floodplain of the, yeah. of the river, load it on barges and drag it up river to where the yeah. creek was. Um, so I, I think, but also, um, you know, the, the Roman aristocracy were very fond of hunting. And even now, that area is full of duck and geese and things like that. Um, so I, I suspect it was basically um, quite braided water, not water meadow, but um, waterlogged land with a quite a mixture of, of, of wildlife and things in it. Um, and then looking to the, the whatever was on the other side of the, um, the river, which um, is an interesting question as well. 
But that watercourse does provide you with a physical link between the Roman city and the medieval city. Yeah. yeah. Of course, one of the remarkable things about Berylanian is you look at something like the cathedral, virtually all of it is Roman building material. Yes, not, yes. Not. And um, through the geophysics, we can see where they stole it from. Yes. <laughs> um, you know, it's quite clear in places that they've dug down, they've found Watling Street, and they've just followed the road uh, and coiled it away. Um, so there's big chunks of road which are just missing. Um, and I think that's what they've done is that they've, they've, Walton Street was visible as a slight sort of bank. They dug yeah. down, found the road, and then just literally chased it along, um, stealing the thing out of the uh, uh, out of Walton Street. Well, Chris, we just had another question that's coming, which is, um, why do you think the wall was built when it was? When it was? Yeah. Um, what's it, yeah what, what's well, the genre behind the construction? You, you have to put it slightly in context. So... On the continent, um, many towns were defended in the third century. Um, and it's a mixture of the um, large numbers of civil wars, which are fought in the third century between various um, usurpers and so on, uh, and the threat across the Rhine and the Danube. The problem is that most of the town wall circuits, third century town wall circuits on the continent, are much smaller, have big bastions, and look like precursors of medieval castles, essentially. They're really heavily defended, like Perigueux is a good example. Um, Roman Britain, uh, a lot of the town walls seem to date to sometime in the third century, but most of them are these big rambling wall circuits, and they don't really have bastions, and they have nice gates and all the rest of it. So I always rather jokingly think that, you know, an edict went out that towns had to defend themselves. And us sitting in Britain, where everything was quite quiet and nothing much was happening, um, went back to what they used to do in the first century AD, which is build town walls, which are more to do with status and ego and less to do with actually defending yourself. Um, and, and although we always talk about the third century crisis, uh, when we look at the archaeology of Roman Britain, I think Roman Britain wasn't actually that bad a place in the first century. Um, uh, it seems to be, you know, okay, we, we, we get lots of the base coins, but we get lots of the base coins everywhere. Um, I don't I don't think there is particularly much of a crisis in Rome. But... Okay, Chris, well, th thanks for that. We, an another question that's just uh, come in uh, relates to the possibility for some, quite some longevity for the occupation of the palace site. I mean, looking at the survey work, it doesn't appear to be overlain by lots of later activities. So it, that it might suggest it's quite a persistent structure in the, uh, within the town. Yeah, there's, there's not much sign of anything being built over the top of it. There are definitely hints of things underneath it. There are definitely hints of earlier phases. Mm -hmm. um, so the area between the main... Um, building with the colonnade and all the rest of it, and that funny open building. Um, there's clearly robbed walls in that area, um, and there are clearly a couple of sort of surviving floor levels as well. Um, but they seem to be deeper down in the sequence. So I think that building replaced something on that same site. Um, but I don't see much sign of it then being replaced by another building. Yeah. Uh, so I wouldn't be surprised if it carried on in use through the fourth century. And uh, uh, yeah. make, well, you know, of course, Verlanium is is the classic example where people have argued that the town carried on being occupied into the fifth century. Um, some people believe it, some people don't. Um, yeah. If you if you believe in the the long sequence, then I don't see why it shouldn't have carried on being occupied into um, into the early post Roman period. And then that sort of prompts the question. Um, and you'll hate me for saying this. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, the, we, we, it's wonderful having surveys on on a grand scale like this. And we used to think about geophysical surveys just as a means of finding places to dig. But of course, we now uh, understand that it was a bit daft, and that conducting surveys, large scale surveys, is a, a means to an end in itself. Um, but do you ever see yourself uh, tempted to uh, what we would call in archaeology ground uh, truth? Uh, any of the findings that you've made? Um, there are certain things that I would very much like to ground truth that I've had in mind for, for a while now. Um, so I didn't talk about it today because we didn't have enough time. But 
on the southern side of the town, there's a ditch which I think might be an extension to the town boundary between the 1955 ditch and the town wall. But in order to prove that, I need some dating evidence out of it, and that would be a relatively simple thing. Um, there is one point where the 1955 ditch, the aqueduct, and another feature, which I think might be a Middle Iron Age pit alignment, all intersect. And it struck me that a trench there would answer all sorts of questions about all sorts of phases. Um, and then obviously, um, lots of people want me to dig a hole in the palace <laughs> and, and get some dates and a bit more information about that. All of those things require um, permission from Historic England because it's a scheduled monument and protected. Um, permission from the, the two landowners, Northern City Council in the case of Verlaine and Park and Lord Verlaine and the Gormby Estates in, in the case of the, the Northern Half. Uh, and of course, substantial funding. Um, the big yeah. downside of being interested in Roman archaeology is they threw a lot of stuff away, so you end up with <laughs> vast numbers of finds that you not only have to process, but then find somebody who's going to store it and look after it once you've finished. Well, there must be a huge temptation to do that. Um, uh, yeah, just, yes, there's certainly a temptation. <laughs> and in terms of the survey work, do you, are you, are you, do you intend to continue to, to sort of broaden the survey uh, beyond the constraints of the town? Uh, the town walls to see what's happening out in the wider landscape. Oh yes, yeah, very much so. So I'd really like to do that field that I showed that had potential um, burials and things in it, the other side of the river. Yeah. Um, there's another um, on the other side of the town. There's an area called um, uh, Windridge Farm, uh, where early Roman lead slingshot have come up, and there's okay. a lot of we know there's a lot of archaeology out there from from earlier work. So that's another area I'd like to do. Uh, and I'd also like to try and trace um, where the aqueduct goes up yeah. the valley. Um, so our intention, um, as long as we, we have energy and people and, and machine, is just to keep extending the survey. Um, well, aqueducts uh, are relatively rare things in England, aren't they? Yeah, well, there's a few. There's one at Roxeter. Right. Um, there's one at Dorchester. Um, and, but as I say, they are generally... Um, a glorified muddy ditch, you know. Yeah. So um, forget the Pont du Gard, I'm afraid. We don't, <laughs> we don't, we don't get sort of grand, grand arched stone aqueducts in in Britain. Um, but there are a few around. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think we've come to the end of the questioning there. So it really just falls to me now to um, to say a um, uh, huge thanks to Chris for for giving up his lunch break today and uh, delivering the UCL lunch hour lecture this week. Um, so wonderful. Thanks very much, Chris. And uh, I just sort of urge our uh, audience to uh, continue to sort of watch this space, really, because this is obviously a, a project that's uh, going to carry on for a, a number of years from, from now. So that's terrific, Chris. Thank you very much. And my final task just remains to uh, flag up next week's uh, UCL lunchtime lecturer, um, Professor uh, Julie Davis. So 28th of, of November, uh, Julie's going to be giving uh, a lecture on the topic of medical leadership and gender disparities in England uh, and India. So I um, hope many of you will return uh, for that uh, presentation in a week's time. OK, many thanks and bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank you.